All right, welcome everybody. Very sore. Hey, Miles. Hey, Octavio, Marie, Karen, Nancy, Luann. Hey, everybody. Hey, Heather. Hey. Many good men, ladies and gentlemen. The man with the All right, Miles. You've fulfilled your contract already. Hey, Lori. Hey, Jim. Heather, I am sorry because I uh, had that nasty cold the last week. I coughed so hard I th hurt my back. No, well, it happens. No. Just me getting older, you know. Hey, Octavio, sorry about that. Hey, Susan. Hey, Gladys. Hey, Eric. Hey, Cindy. Hey, everybody. Hey, Chuck. Hey, Timothy. Thank you so much to everybody who has sent in donations today for Hanukkah. It really does mean the world to me. Hey, then, Pat. Hey, Timothy. Hey, Jean. Hey, Heather's in Seattle. Let's see, Roddy loves the car. But now Ronnie is, uh, Ronnie has gotten the same cold that I had, that my doctor had last week. Our favorite mysterious grandma is resting comfortably right now, as I understand it. Hey, everybody. Hey, Beth. Hey, Susan. Miles, miles, miles. Got hmm. my shopping done. Are you kidding me? definitely check out some grunge bands in Seattle. Check local zines and rags for upcoming gigs. I'm going to say our saver S word on the tour. Oh yeah, I bet we are. Ah, Karen, sorry to hear that. Hey, Matthew. Hey, Ellen. See, when you add the SH, I still think of a different word. The first one I thought of. Miles, please watch the keyboard. Oh, I do enjoy some Tel Aviv bakery, Adam. They do know how to bake. Though I gotta say, North Shore Kosher Bakery's bagels are like hamburger buns. You gotta go further down Tui to get the proper bagels. Hey, Bridget and Mary Jo. Should we all just reminisce about grunge rock all night? Because I'm for it. 
Glad you all like my car. Thank you once again for all the people who've been sending me donations today. That really does mean the world. Especially it having been an expensive day. Bought Ronnie's birthday present. Adam, Bialy and Bagel is no longer open 24-7 except on weekends. They open at 6 a.m. now. So when I wake up at 5 o'clock, what can I do? But I tell you this. When I drink NyQuil before de bed, I don't get up super early anymore. Ah, uh, thank you, Chris. I do believe you have all heard by now that next week will be Time Travel Pub Crawl. I actually have here, let me just export this so I can show it to you. I actually found a picture of my brother and I traveling through time. You know, Eli, our ship's mechanic. Traveling through time in a time machine, not unlike the Fool Killer, like an early model of the Fool Killer in 1984. See what a mop top I was in those days. And there we are traveling through space in 1984. And the same couch everybody had at the time. That's the early model of the Fool Killer, the, like the prototype, the Model A. Yeah, I don't know why I was blonde. Hey, Jen. Hey, Aviva. Hey, Octavio. I already got you, Octavio. Well, Kristen, I definitely got trapped in that basket on several non-consecutive occasions. Evening, everybody, and welcome along. Yeah, Casey, if you turn it upside down, it becomes a duplicator. But we've already seen that happen on the time travel pub crawls, so. Hey, Floresita. Hey, Larry. Hey, Robert. I'm sipping on some buffalo trays tonight. Hey, Christine. Hey, Lisa. Glad to have you. Hey, Leslie. Eggnog ice cream. Well, that sounds all right. I just had some uh, candy cane ice cream myself. Uh, oh, my back is sore. I coughed too hard trying to get all of the gunk out. I, I hacked up enough gunk the last couple of days I could probably make a golem. Isn't that a, tra a Hanukkah tradition, hacking up enough gunk to make a golem out of it? You sick a snot golem on somebody, they you, they will get out of your way. The things you get when you tune into this show. Hey, Kathleen. No, Octavio, not that kind of golem. A golem is a, a person you make out of clay, and then if you put the Hebrew word for truth up on its head, it'll come to life and terrorize the countryside until you cross out the last letter and it just says met, and then it says dead, and then it dies. Hey, 
Yeah, Pat, I did once break a rib from coughing. That was years ago. Sna Susan, you're right. Snot Gollum, in fact, would make a great grunge band name. So, Heather, while you're in Seattle, if you're planning to start a grunge band, Snot Gollum. That's the name. We're going to let Benny Goodman finish up this song. So they just put me in the liner notes. Sunday morning show of the Blava Clay. Kind of rings a bell, but I'm not placing it. Hey, Mary. Hey, Kathy. Thank you. I wasn't super into the new car when I got it, but now that it's painted, I'm very into it. Now it feels like my car. Oh, he has some great German expressionism under Gollum. It was later parodied on The Simpsons. Octavio got kicked out of zoo lights. I don't want to know. Dana, no one knows, but three out of four cars are either white, black, or silver today. Benny Goodman is wrapping this up. My throat's a little bit off today from having a cold for a week. I'm trying to get it back in time for Monday. I got History Channel filming. Benny Goodman coming to you live from the Joseph Urban Room of the Congress Hotel in downtown Chicago. So I think it's time that we go ahead and start this hoot and nanny. Buttons, 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 buttons! All right. Welcome along, everybody. I'm Adam Seltzer for Mysterious Chicago Tours. I've been a tour guide and historian here in Chicago for almost 20 years now. I've got about a dozen Chicago history books out, including uh, Mysterious Chicago, the book, Just Kill Me, which is a novel about a ghost tour guide who makes places more haunted by killing people at them. H.H. H. Holmes, The True History of the White City Devil, Flickering Empire, How Chicago Invented the U.S. Film Industry, Murder Maps USA, and Graceland Cemetery, Chicago Stories, Symbols, and Secrets, relatively new from University of Illinois Press. So, I'm also on the History Channel, the Travel Channel, and Netflix all the time. I got some History Channel filming coming up this week, so I really hope I get my voice back, as right now we're about, like, uh, what we have to do the Tom Waits tour. Maybe I'll just be William Griffith. Now and then, what I would do in the old days, when I first had a book out under the name William Griffith, as I would do interviews talking like this. This is Wild Bill Griffith, who lives underneath the L tracks on Lake Street. <coughs> so, all right. So, welcome along. Today, we are going to do one that we do uh, usually around this time of year. It's actually one of my favorite ones that we do called Shopping History in Chicago. It's really a very cool thing. I wish I had a chance to go down to State Street and get some video of the uh, Marshall Fields windows today. Macy's windows. Nobody really cares. And, uh... I didn't really have time this week as my car was off at the Painters, but we will get there sometime by the end of this uh, season. So let's just move on in here. What the heck was this? I don't know. So this was Chicago circa 1812 or so. Right behind me with the flag was Fort Dearborn. Across the way by that time was John Kinsey's house. John Kinsey was the subtler. He was the one who sold goods to the soldiers of Fort Dearborn. He had kind of exclusive rights to do so, which meant that he could sell at pretty much whatever price he wanted to. Just as a way of getting a, a view of where we were at this point, it was right across from the London Guarantee Building. This is about where the fort is right now. And the area here where that uh, cabin was is over about the vicinity of the Wrigley Building. Now, should be noted, we really have no idea 
what John Kinsey looked like. There's a lot of, it's a, it's a very difficult guy to research because a lot of times people would talk about John Kinsey, they really met his son, John H. Kinsey. Uh, but we do know that he was said to look exactly like this one British politician. How the hell anybody knew what this one British politician looked like is kind of beyond me, but they stuck with that in any case. Now, at the time, at the uh, very early days of Chicago, when it was still really just a frontier town, there was a place a little bit further down the river, right about here on Lake Street, where Wild Bill Griffith lives now. It's a place called the Saganash Hotel. This was sign of the center of commerce for Chicago at the time. This is H.O. Stone, who is now at Rose Hill Cemetery and part of that tour, uh, riding up to the old Saganash Hotel. On the side there, you can see this little, like, little shed kind of garage-looking thing off to the side of it. If you look really closely, it even looks like there's a guy standing out there waving. That would presumably be Philo Carpenter who ran this little little building next to the Saganash was his apothecary shop. He was Chicago's first pharmacist. This was kind of the center of trading in Chicago in the early 1830s. Take a look at the map here. It would have been, you see the James R. Thompson Center, a couple of blocks west of that, left of that, we should say. And as you can see here, this is about how the city looked at the time. And really just about the same, except that the, uh, you can see that there's this, like, this elephant trunk bend in the river. Instead of going directly out from at about Grand Avenue, it took a five-block trip south with this big sandbar, and then it would join Lake Michigan. They dredged that out in the 1830s. A uh, the guy they brought in to do that was a guy by the name of Orsemus Morrison, who had learned how to do stuff like that while working on the Erie Canal. That'll come up in a second. So this is Lake Street as it looks today. Right now it's kind of obscured on Lake Street by the railroad tracks. But in the very early days of Chicago, when it first started growing up and having being a center of commerce, this is kind of where all of the commerce was, around here on Lake Street going alongside, well, the lake. Oh, alongside the river, really. So this is how it looked back then. Just a little bit over would have been the incredibly smelly river. In the midst of it was the Tremont House, owned by James and Ira Couch. And in the 1830s, 1840s, as it started to grow, one of your bigger department stores was a place called L.D. Almsteads, which sold fancy and staple dry goods here on Lake Street. Keep constantly on hand one of the largest and most desirable stocks of dry goods to be found west of the city. Awesome. I love dry goods. I was, you know... I was just talking about how I could never quite get enough of dry goods. Their bigger rival, T.B. Carter, who had shawls, shawls, among the many desirable goods now offered by T.B. Carter. A large and choice lot of shawls, nearly every style and kind, comprising brooch and long and square shawls, white, blue, green, drab, and crimson centers, plain cashmeres, blue, green, drab, and black printed cashmere suitable for the present season, black and colored silk and white, black crepe, Bay Street, Long and Square, do as good as ever. Waterton, Empire State, and Scotch, Long and Square shawls. Morning shawls, various styles and prices. Opera shawls, something new and desirable. Crepe and cashmere, scarves of various styles. We've all got to get opera shawls. Why do we not have opera shawls? Got to figure this one out. Another one of their, not, not to be outdone, L.D. Olmsted uh, came back with their own. Shawls! Shawls! They wish to call attention to their customer of their very superior stock of brooch mantle shawls. These shawls are recently purchased at the lowest market price, and we can sell them at a small but uniform percentage above cost. That our prices are low, our unprecedented sales are a sufficient guarantee. Bay State shawls. We have in all the new colors. What were the new colors? Brown, drab, tan, Ooh, a drab shawl. I've always wanted a drab shawl. But why don't they make cars in drab anymore? And to get this down below, our friends will always find our shawl room plentifully supplied with everything in this department of our trade, which we shall be happy to in exhibit for their inspection. Wouldn't we go nuts at the shawl room? Like, imagine the group of middle school girls busting into the shawl room. Every clerk's nightmare. 
Uh, they were also at T.B. Carter selling an object to raise the wind. There are various ways of doing this, but a good one during the 94-ish sort of weather we had had hereabouts from the 13th to the 15th of June is to go to T.B. Carter's, 118 Lake Street, and buy a three-cent palm leaf fan and commence vibrating it to and fro. A very respectable breeze can be got up in this way on, no sh on short no ice. It is not everybody, every booty, who keeps, who keeps these three-cent fans. Being in Troy, New York last year, and some of the meltingest kind of weather, we tried to get one and couldn't. Here we see one of the most basic forms of advertising, create a fear, create a need. What if it gets this hot and I can't find a three-cent palm leaf fan? I'm going to melt. So T.B. Carter is now buried here at Graceland Cemetery. Now, most of the commerce there was on Lake Street, one notable exception was right about here where Blick is now, on State, was the shop of the first woman merchant known in Chicago, Mrs. Carberry. Not a lot is really known about Mrs. Carberry, but she had a ladies' trimming and fancy store at State and Monroe, about 1852, selling whalebone hosiery. Whale bones, gloves, cones, rosewood. Where are the shawls? Yeah, I'm not going to a place that doesn't advertise their shawls. How fancy can it really be? But this brings us to young Potter Palmer. Well, this is kind of an earlier, a later shot of Palmer, Potter Palmer. One of them where he looks like a little Methodist preacher guy. Um, the Potter Palmer was working for a guy named George Fox out in Lockport, New York. Now, George Fox was a Quaker. They did not believe in bargaining. I am not sure why, but the big thing in department stores in those days was they, they didn't have set prices. Everybody was supposed to haggle. Bargaining was just standard. But for one reason, I'm not really sure why, but Quakers didn't believe in that. So, in Lockport one day... Potter Palmer was looking around for an opportunity. That's what you did as a clerk. You looked about you. And one day he saw an order for all this stone that was going to build a courthouse in a place called Chicago and figured, if there's a city that has, needs that much stone, that must be a city to look at. I've got to go take a, take a peek. So he went out to Chicago and got himself a block right here on the 1850s. Right, right here in the 1850s on Lake Street, thinking this is a city on the grow, this is a place where I can make a name for myself. So he opened this brand new place, the Dry Goods House by P. Palmer, one of our best established and most widely known merchants who removes from his old stand on the south side of Lake Street. This is when he moved to his new, new, new digs. But this happened, to st he, he got into the business right when Elizabeth Cady Stanton was starting to make the first push for women's rights. Well, not the very first, but kind of the early days of modern feminism, they had some trouble convincing women that they should push for voting rights. That was just going a little too far for people at the time. That wasn't really an issue on people's minds. Uh, what she had more successful in saying was, listen, if you're supposed to be doing all the cooking, you should be the one buying the food, you should be the one buying the kitchen equipment. Take hold of the purse strings, go out and buy. Now, Field, shown here at age 24, uh, realized that this was a growing market. Uh, I'm sorry, that's Potter Palmer. Potter Palmer realized that this was a growing market selling to women. So instead of having a dry goods store that had a whiskey barrel in the back where everybody would sit around haggling over prices, he thought that instead he would cater his work over towards women customers. You know, nicer things. People can inspect things. And one of the biggest things, 1861, he announced to country customers, people who ordered from them instead of uh, actually showing up, that if you ordered something and for any reason didn't like it, you could send it back for a refund. This return policy was a brand new idea. A lot of people thought it was going to absolutely ruin him, but he actually had some money to kick around at the time. This was 1861. Now, not only did he see the, uh, how the rise of feminism might impact shopping, he also saw how the, if the South was serious about seceding from the Union, the price of cotton was likely to skyrocket. So he bought up all the cotton he could in 1860. That was a really, really good investment. Now, meanwhile, at the same time, 
Young Marshall Field was getting started. A little bit further off. But 1864, he was with Farwell and Field. He started in 1855 and made $400 a year and managed to save half of it, so living on just over 50 cents a day. 1864, he bought, uh, bought into a share with Farwell, but he didn't really get along with Mr. Farwell. So he asked the McCormick brothers, those horrible jerks, to help him, help him to buy Farwell out. Meanwhile, Potter Palmer was suffering from ill health by then, and decided to get out of the business, went off to Paris, and sold everything off to a uh, young Marshall Field. So this became Cooley, Farwell, and Co., and then F Cooley, Farwell, and F Farwell, Field, and Co., and then eventually just Pot Marshall Fields. So this was still when the business district was down on Lake Street, running alongside the Smelly River. But when Potter Palmer got out of the business, right at the time when the Civil War was ending and the price of the goods just plummeted, he went over to Paris where he saw the effects of Haussmanization. It's like Monsieur Haussmann was overseeing the modernization of Paris, moving the whole city around, turning it from a medieval jumble into a modern city, and he thought sooner or later this is going to have to happen in Chicago. And he realized that having the, the business district going along the Smelly River wasn't going to be sustainable. Also, it ended at the river. Whereas if they went on from State Street, they could go quite a bit further down. So he figured out that this was going to be the site to build new stuff. So he started building a Palmer house. He talked Marshall Field into building a new store over there. And so they built themselves a marble palace. Here they are in 1866. The Field store was selling Yankee Notions. Sewing supplies. Also umbrellas, sun umbrellas, and small wares at the lowest prices. Palmer by this time was really just kind of a silent partner, but he had talked them into moving over onto State Street. Laura, did they save any of this loud on them? I'm just noticing over there in the comments. I can't miss that. But this was all set up in the late 1860s. Five years later came the Great Chicago Fire, which wrecked all of this stuff. But, of course, Chicago got right away rebuilding. This is a Mr. W.D. Kerfoot's shop. The famous sign at the at the sign there WD Kerfoot all gone but wife children and energy so here's what field just kind of set up a sign saying that the cash boys and work girls will still be paid please show up at our new place 60 calumet and as quickly as possible they got something else off the ground again and as they rebuilt it got more and more fancy like this so most of this stuff, the retail built business was really just kind of a showroom. The retail business almost never actually made money. They made their money in wholesale. They had a warehouse down about here, down about where the Sears Tower is now. That was built by Henry Hobson Richards, Henry uh, Henry Richardson, who also did the Glessner House. But wholesale was where they made their money. The retail shop, similar to like a shop on Fifth Avenue or the Magnificent Mile today, were not really money makers in and of themselves. They were just there to establish the brand to make the wholesale stuff more desirable. But eventually, Field started building this place on State Street, rebuilding and making it more iconic. It grew very gradually over the course of about 30 years, expanding all the way back to Wabash. And on beyond. In the 1880s, he brought in Harry Selfridge as his general manager. Where did I go? There I am. 
Now, Harry Selfridge had a lot of big ideas. We now credit Marshall Fields with a lot, of innovative, a lot of innovations, like the return policy, which was really Potter Palmer's idea, and things like big display windows, which was very much a Harry Selfridge thing, having a tea room, also a Harry Selfridge thing. Marshall Field himself had to be dragged kicking and screaming into all of these innovations. Very old-fashioned old man. Nobody really liked Marshall Field very much. Even Mr. Selfridge. So... Selfridge started having a lot more stuff on display, realized that they were really in a visual business here. He really wanted to make the retail business itself more profitable. Started uh, having yards and yards of, of uh, material, and also really expanded the telephone operations. Had a lot of what were known as the Hello Girls. As telephones became more and more common, there were always people ready to answer the phone at Marshall Fields. Very big innovation at the time. Also had started having things like the jewelry and the perfume right on the first floor. So when people walked in, it would smell very nice after just coming in off of a street full of horse shit. Sorry, this is in effing Chicago. But. Then they opened up the Walnut Room, which was, uh, they, they started with just a regular tea room, then eventually fancy dining at the Walnut Room. The idea was you could go to Marshall Field and spend the whole day there. It's an obvious uh, benefit to having your customers stay in the store longer and longer and longer. And the Walnut Room, of course, became a tradition that endures today, even though the store isn't officially Marshall Fields anymore. Like, this is uh, the Walnut Room in 1959, with its enormous Christmas tree. The Walnut Room just more recently, right there. Now, really pushing the Christmas season is another thing Harry Selfridge was very much behind. Uh, especially the big Christmas display windows, still a tradition in department stores everywhere. Harry Selfridge really got that off the ground. Also, big Christmas advertisings. Since 1896 at Marshall Field & Co., we allow no misstatement, no exaggeration, and even the slightest degree to enter into any of our announcements. Every statement is made and our advertisements can be absolutely depended on. Our prices are unquestionably the lowest in Chicago. Well, that was crap, but... <laughs> <coughs> Here we see another of his real innovations. 27 shopping days until Christmas. So this was like November 28th. Sheesh. No, no, this is uh, November 23rd this came out. It wasn't even Thanksgiving yet. But there weren't shop there certain days weren't shopping days that were still going to be closed on Sundays. What they've got down here. Moleskin sets for $47.50. Alaska Seal coats for $195. That was a lot of money at the time. Just like thousands and thousands in today's money. Fine furniture, the practical gift. Sales of Sale of samples and elaborately designed costumes. Sue sample sales. Here's, the, here's two years later in 1905. Women's black broadcloth coats, four models, $20. That's a much better deal than the seal coats. Still quite a lot of money, though. Distinctively new styles of fine quality of black broadcloth, interlined and lined with, throughout with black or pearl gray skin or satin, or with white peau de seal. The value giving is unusual at $20. Kid gloves for Christmas gifts. So, eventually, Selfridge got fed up. He was doing all the innovations. He was making Marshall Field an untold amount of money. And he was paid very well for it. But he finally came to Marshall Field and said, Listen, I want to rearrange our partnership here. I want this place to be called Marshall Field and Selfridge. I want to be a full partner. And Marshall Field said, Okay, goodbye. And Selfridge said, I'll give you two weeks' notice and help train my replacement. And he said, no, no, you can go this afternoon if you want to. They had just never been close. So Selfridge announced that he was going to be opening a new place right across the street, taking control of Schlesinger and Meyer at State and Madison's, this beautiful building. Here's Selfridge himself. We'll see the building in just a second. Well, here's Selfridge himself. He was married to Rosalie Buckingham, who was a real estate developer in and of herself. But the building that he took over was the one we now usually know as the Carthen, Carson Prairie Scott Building in Chicago. Though my school groups who come into Chicago know it as the Goth Target. This is a, a well-known building among teenagers all over the place. I guess it was on TikTok or whatever the kids are on nowadays. 
take a quick look at this. Goth target. Louis Sullivan design. Magnificent. And Pat, um, Rosalie, uh, Buckingham Fountain was named after Rosalie's cousin Clarence. Let's check out some of the windows here. Well, Target doesn't really go all out with their holiday windows. Or they were about to. Making black pony coats. Garments, 22 shopping days and remaining until Christmas. You can see that they were still going. Uh, he carried over a lot of the ideas that he had at Marshall Fields just over onto here. And here's State and Madison as it appeared at the time. But the thing is, all of the talented retail clerks were still working at Marshall Fields. Harry Selfridge had a really hard time getting this store off the ground. So after just about a year, it was closed. He sold it to Carson Prairie and Scott and moved to London to open the Selfridges department store, which became an institution in London eventually. It still exists, I believe. They call it, it's mostly Miss Selfridges now, mostly known for cosmetics, I think. But here we can see it uh, in the 1910s, after it became Carson Prairie and Scott. But let us look just a little ways down the block here. Now... The thing about these department stores, Selfridges and Marshall Field, was they sold fancy stuff. They worked for the carriage trade. Very fancy goods, very expensive goods. Their prices were definitely not unquestionably the lowest in Chicago. Casey asks, what kind of shawls do the goth kids wear? Drab shawls, of course. So just down the road there on State Street, the Lehman Brothers opened up a place called The Fair which sold fancy goods, they called them fancy, but at much, much lower prices. Northwest State and Adams, this is how they looked in the 1870s. By 1888, they had expanded to look like this. Eighteen ninety-seven, they looked just as fancy, at least on the outside, as Marshall Fields. We can also see here now, here's what they were selling, circa 1897. Forty bargains for today. Millinery, hats for a quarter, boys' suits for $1.50, velvet capes for three seventy-five. Much better than a seal, a seal coat for 195 I don't know if it's necessarily a better bargain, but definitely more affordable. Men's suits, seven forty. Ladies' suits, five ninety-five. Ladies' skirts, four ninety-eight. This still wouldn't be exactly cheap in today's money. I mean, four ninety eight. That's a uh, hundred and fifty, two hundred bucks in today's money. Thereabouts. It's always imperfect when you try to go with inflation inflation adjustments. But this is what it looked like on the inside. Still looked very fancy on the inside, though. I like to imagine the lights were like blue light special lights. And incidentally, the Laymans have two tombs here in Chicago. One is at Forest Home Cemetery, this cool one with the lion that was even rigged up with electric lighting, though they never ended up using it. It's been sitting there empty the whole time. It was on sale a while ago for a couple hundred thousand dollars, which for a mausoleum like this is dirt bargain basement cheap. Look at how they stare at you. Those lions scare the crap out of me. But they never used it because they ended up building themselves a more stately estate over a Graceland cemetery. Coyotes love hanging out by this place. Now, some other locations. You can still see up there, if you look real close, you can still see a, an old ghost sign, a faded sign for the Boston store. This was at Northwest State and Ma Northwest Corner of State and Madison. So across the street, where the Sears eventually was. Remember Sears? That's not there anymore either. But it was another large department store. Still see some ghost signs for it up where it used to be. <coughs> Here it is in 1902 when it was brand new. They, too, had a grill, which doesn't look nearly as fancy as the walnut room. But 
And here's what they were selling in 1935. For her, perfume bottles. Cody Menset, for her. Um, Cody Perfume, Hudnut Gemery set, Ayers Beauty set, Manicure set. All kinds of stuff. I really want to be the guy in the For Him ad, you know, nothing but leather and whiskey all the time. That's pretty much me. <laughs> now, of course, going back a little ways, on Randolph Street was my favorite of all of these places, Western Hall. Now, I have no idea what it was like on the inside of Western Hall. I think they just sold cheap clothes, but I love their advertisements. If you have been paying, for, you have been paying too much for clothing. If you seek proof, call it Western Hall Clothing, Gents Furnishing Establishment. Here they were at Christmas, a handsome Christmas gift with every article sold during the holidays at Western Hall. See, they did say the holidays back then too. But they started having this advertising campaign about 1865, where they would have the poet, the bard of Western Hall would write these long, long poems about the place. You know, you couldn't have jingles in, it, in the newspaper ad exactly. But the last verse goes, Then sat he down with hope all dead, Until of Western Hall he read, 72 Randolph Street he sought, A suit of Dagnan's cut he bought, And hastening home again to try, Read triumph in the nip's bright eye. Joy, joy, he cried, My advice to all is buy your clothes at Western Hall. And he um, got a bit of a re reputation for himself. The bard of Western Hall, whoever he may be, has certainly achieved an enviable local notoriety and invested the house he has immortalized with a strange historic interest. And though he is reported as the recipient of a princely salary, could evidently leave footprints in the sand of time in some other branch of literature. I would say how, how immortal could he really be, who is, the hell has ever heard of Western Hall, but here we are, still talking about him now nearly 160 years later. But of course, Western Hall also ran my very favorite ad that I have ever run across. 1865, Shortland, shortly after Richmond was taken back from the Confederates, they ran this fantastic ad. Richmond has fallen. And so have prices at Western Hall. It's like something from The Simpsons. Now let's move, uh, we, this is moving back in time from our previous timeline, now let's move up and talk about the 1980s when they decided to turn State Street into a mall. Now State Street had kind of fallen a hundred hard times at the time, more people were going shopping out in the suburbs where the malls had opened up. State Street, the, uh, the old grand movie palaces were showing like kung fu movies, um, nothing but bus exhaust for days, it wasn't really a place where people came to hang out and gather anymore. Like, this is uh, State Street in 1979 when they opened up the State Street Mall, which uh, was closed to vehicle traffic except for buses, which kind of defeated the purpose. So for several years, you couldn't drive your car down State Street. They had just tried to turn it into an outdoor mall. But this is what it looked like in 79 when they started. You can see uh, what's showing at the movie theater today. Blackula was showing at the Chicago Theater. State and Lake across the street, I can't quite read that one. But you can see they're uh, getting it set up to look like a mall. Once it opened up, it looked like this, with these circular benches, this pointless blackstone architecture, just like you would see in malls circa 1979. But it was known as a horrible flop. The fact that buses could still go down the street really kind of defeated the purpose. It still wasn't necessarily safe for pedestrians. You had bus exhaust like crazy. And eventually they started letting cars go down there again. Now let's cover quickly some of the graves of these guys. This is Potter and Bertha Palmer, who have their own Parthenon up here on the lake at Graceland Cemetery. And just on the other side, the Marshall Field family plot. Now, if you adjust for inflation, the fortune Marshall Field accumulated was like similar to like Elon Musk level fortune today. Nobody liked Marshall Field either. Now, let's check out. This is from a few years ago, but let's check out the windows 
at Marshall Fields from the, uh, 2020. I'm a little behind here. I was sick this week, so I couldn't really sick and didn't have my car, so I couldn't really go get the new ones. But we'll we'll check them out this week for sure. Maybe I should just have the, the music. Speaking of Music Box, the Music Box Theater just announced they're going to be showing Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid in 35mm in February. Movie featuring Bob Dylan in a supporting role. He also wrote the music for it, including a little song called Knocking on Heaven's Door. And in the rehearsals, a song that he never quite finished called Rock Me Mama. But Old Crow Medicine Goat Show got a hold of the rehearsal tape and turned it into Wagon Wheel, which became arguably just as famous as Knocking on Heaven's Door. Productive session, even if one of the songs took 30 years. Now, Chris, isn't isn't there a Christmas party at the home of Farmer Gray? It'll be the perfect ending of a perfect day. I mean, like, Jingle Bells is not really a Christmas song. It's about drag racing. Oh, and I got the 2021 windows here, too. Take a quick look in here. Give love believe. I will give love some believe this year. 2021 was the year that my camera got weird. With Tiptoe the Reindeer and some really bad rhymes. I remember this now. Tiptoe the Reindeer. Off to flight school to chase their dreams. Something, something, magic schemes. In the meadow we can build a snowman And pretend that he is Parson Brown He'll say, are you married? We'll say, no, we're just screwing What are you going to do about it, churchy? Mind your own business and get out of town And I should have uh, done a better job of getting these. Uh, the, the Chapter 1. Polar Bear and Penguin knew they had to act fast. We need a plan before Christmas has passed. They gathered other friends to a pleather, pleather scheme. They rhymed that with machine. Now, Casey, I once put up a thing about how Frosty the Snowman was actually about something that happened in Park Ridge, where allegedly a snowman was brought to life, and there's like a blurry picture of it. One of those things that I thought was an obvious joke, I called it the Frosty Files. But people ask me if I could send them the picture all the time. For a while there. Don't look down now. She just can't believe she's this high. 
Me neither. A flock of feathered friends keeps tiptoe in the sky. So I do like the color scheme in these. But all right, everybody. As you can hear, my voice is kind of shot from having been hacking up enough gunk to make my own golem over the course of the past week. Having had that cold that everybody's getting, my doctor had it last week, my wife's got it now. Um, so upcoming next week, we will be doing Time Travel Pub Call Presents Drink Like the Dickens. As you can see, my brother and I have been tra uh, traveling through time and space in uh, strange crafts ever since 1984. I think that's out of duplex. Now, that's the only other thing on the schedule right now. This being this time of year, I don't really have much going on. Uh, people don't really sign up for walking tours in Chicago this time of year. Who can blame them? So this time of year, I'm working on books. Finishing up a book about Trinity Churchyard and St. Paul's Churchyard in Manhattan right now. And just signed a contract today. There is going to be a Johan Hawk book. Uh, that'll come out through Arcadia. Just signed the contract. Uh, I'll keep you all posted on that, of course. And so in the meantime, I'm going to try to save my voice as much as I can, but we will just hang out like we always do. So thanks a lot for joining me, everybody. I'm Adam from Mysterious Chicago Tours. Remember, there's only 11 shopping days left until Christmas. Happy Hanukkah for the rest of us. Uh, not all the rest of us, but many of the rest of us, I'm sure. But all right, everybody, let's put the Benny Goodman back on, and we'll just hang out. Let us now compare architectures. Now and then I have to do a boat tour and my voice was like this. I was like, today we're doing the Tom Waits version. Like, yes. <laughs> the L, the, the L, the L goes rattling by like the ghost of Gene Krupa. As the moon rolls maverick under an obsidian sky. I'm bed, Ma Lisa. Thanks, Indy. Well, that's the roughest my voice has been on one of these in a long time. Hope I get it back by Monday. Yeah, in the meantime, I will not be talking very much. I got various lozenges and things for this, though. Let me see if I can at least make... So Capone knew that he had to act fast. Oh, no, no, no. Jeannie, you know it. Let me find Miles in a second. He hung out a lot at the beginning. Now, Chris and I can always just do like, yeah, I'm Wild Bill Griffith, author of American Mafia Chicago. I live underneath the L tracks. Oh, yeah, Phoenix, this would happen a lot on the boat tours, in fact. That's why my last tour of the day was my martini tour, where I would switch to water bottle number two. I don't think anybody ever noticed, but I would have, like, my sentences would kind of go careening on top of each other. Oh, you feel old. Some of the kids that I hang out with. Just hang out at the bar with a person who described herself as an elder gay. She's 26. She's an elder gay because she vaguely remembers the time before gay marriage was a thing.
Presents are under the lid, yeah. Doreen duly noted. I never really tried NyQuil PM before, but I'm loving it. Hey, Arlene, as soon as we log off, it'll be up for you to rewatch um, at any time. And after about a couple minutes. The Hawk book's going to be a challenge. They want a much tighter word count on it than I would have liked. But what can you do? Thanks so much to you guys who are sending in donations tonight. It really does mean a lot. No, thanks, Arlene. Yeah, this will be back up as soon, about five minutes afterwards, after we, after we log off here. other pictures I got up here. This is... Huh? I don't know why I put those up there. Oh, thanks, Eileen. We will check the mail soon. <laughs> now that I got my car back, I can go check the P.O. box. Probably the day that I go do the uh, windows. Maybe I'll do that Saturday. I just got Ronnie some honey night will. Arlene, how was it? I, I've eaten at the walnut room once. I liked it. Marina, it'll probably be four or five days. Everybody I know seems to be getting something that feels not quite like a cold, but it's not COVID. I really hope she feels better. Thank you for the mucal healing, Phoenix. Now, gee, I don't really feel sore. It's just kind of worn. Uh, let me see if I can find Miles again. Miles? 
Miles. How about this? Just like Eli and I in 1984. Remember when we used to do airplane rides, Miles? Where you got too big for that? Wanna go see the 80s? Wanna go back in time and see what the 80s were like? They were really brown. You think it's all like the Memphis design style, but that's mostly just on like folders and stuff. And double dare sets. Really, it's all still a lot of wood panel. But you wanna see it? <laughs> Aww. Oh, this is hurting my back today. Yeah, Priya is currently under the table. Lily's off doing her own thing someplace. So usually Miles likes boxes that are just a little bit too small for him. But today I found him in this larger one. Good night, Arlene. Bob, yep. Thanks again, everybody who's been sending in donations. That really does mean leave, mean the world. Uh, no, uh, none of them really leave the apartment other than going up and down the stairs sometimes. They do like to run up and down the stairs now and then. Ooh, Megan, what kind of pie you get? Ooh, s'mores pie, those are good. Nineteen eighty four. Now, Casey, uh, Beat It came out in 1982, but 84 is when it really took off, after the Thriller video. Audrey, yep, still have the PayPal. I can make that appear, yep. Very clever, very clever, very troll. Thanks, everybody who's been sending me Hanukkah donations all day. That really does mean the world. Helps tremendously. <coughs> Good luck with the cat med, Susan. I know how that goes. Speak 
Good night, Gina. Once again, you can get uh, Mysterious Chicago shawls on CafePress.com slash Mysterious Chicago. Enjoy Andrew Susan. All right, this is a little bit earlier than I normally wrap up, but as you can hear, my voice is just shot tonight. So I am going to go make myself some tea. I have a pretty good supply of throat coat on me right now. So thanks a lot for joining me, everybody. Thanks again, once again, to everybody who's been sending donations. It means the world. Um, time travel pub crawl next week. Get your drinks ready. This is the Drink Like the Dickens edition, one of my very favorites. So thanks, everybody. I'm Adam from Mysterious Chicago Tours, telling everybody to stay safe and stay strong. And, of course, if you can, stay spooky, everybody.